Okay, ladies and gentlemen, once again, we are in the British and American culture lecture. <clears throat> this is gonna be a, this is gonna be a big one. Um, I'm gonna do my best to be as comprehensive and concise as possible. Um, a note on my mustache progress. I think I've hit uh, something in between Victorian gentleman and American 1980s construction worker which is exactly where I want to be right now. No, um, <clears throat> this is just an experiment. And when we're in class, you know, I'll have my mask on. So uh, I, look, <clears throat> I look like uh, my regular self. Like, uh, like the rest of us. <clears throat> but uh, you, have to put up, you have to put up with me uh, for one more week because this is what we're gonna do. This is Wednesday's lecture. Um, I'm wrapping up the 16th century uh, as well as I can. If you have any questions, please send them to me fast because this Friday is our quiz. That's gonna be the 15th, right? Okay, so <clears throat> two days from now, we've got quiz number three. That's the last quiz before the, the midterm because next week is the midterm, so. I'm going to keep the stuff online, and we're going to do the midterm online, too. This Friday, 11 o'clock, quiz number three. You know the drill. Log, out, log in, uh, enter the Google form, put in the information, finish before 11.10, done, okay? Uh, I will be doing one lecture, full lecture, on Friday, and then on the weekend, I will upload a short lecture, which will, which will just sort of summarize and review what we've done so far. You have your first three quizzes. If you put your email address in properly, then you, you get the scores released with the questions so you can look at them. If you skip the quiz, that's your fault, okay? Um, I'm not gonna send out copies of the quiz to everybody if you're going to skip quizzes for whatever reason. Um, if you have a proper excuse, then I can give you a copy of the quiz. If you skip it, then that's your fault. Uh, all the material we've done so far is game for the midterm. So, but as I said before, <clears throat> I've mentioned it many times, I've given you a lot of information to, to flesh out the story, to help you remember the important things. But I'm not gonna ask you, you don't need to know the material as well as me. I'm not trying to train you to, be, uh, to teach this class. Keep this in mind. So the major things, if you get a handle of the major things, especially the things on the board, and a student asked me, please stand to the side <clears throat> more often because I wanna see the board. But my answer to you is I, I do move from side to side and you get to see the whole board. When you see it, there's this pause button. You know, it's not a gigantic board. Like in the classroom, there's a board that's like five meters long. So you'll be able to see the board the whole time. But unfortunately, my studio isn't a classroom size. So my screen isn't gonna show the board the whole time. So if you wanna see something on the board and I mention it, then, you know, pause the video, make your notes, and then unpause it. But anyway, I'll try to, I wanna stand in the center most of the time, but I'll try to move to the side more often at the request of a particular student. Everybody has their, Everybody has their little things. I can't satisfy everyone, but my suggestion is if you want to really make sure you catch something, of course, uh, I don't usually erase very much. So at any point during the video, pause it and then write it down, okay? Or take a screenshot. Then you don't even need to pause it. Genius. <clears throat> Technology is wonderful, my friends. Okay, anyway, um, <clears throat> today, 16th century done. That's going to be all of this chapter will be on the quiz. And I'm going to sort of add a lot of the stuff I'm going to say um, is going to not, not be in the book, which I, which I lecture on on Friday. So let me point this out in, right away. Page 116 about the English Civil War. That part forward to the end of the chapter with Isaac Newton um, Isaac Newton, John Locke, the intellectual giants of the 17th century, 
That stuff is not on the quiz. I'm not gonna talk about that today. I'm gonna talk about it after the quiz. So it will be on the midterm, okay? So let me be clear. Uh, page 116 to page 123, okay? <clears throat> is, is not gonna be on uh, right until the end of the chapter. So don't worry about page 116 to the end of the chapter because we don't have time to cover that stuff today. So I'm going to deal with it after the quiz. Um, there'll be one more lecture, which will be included on the midterm, but not in our quiz, okay? Let me write that down on the board, just for your reference. Stick it up here. Not page 116 to the end of the chapter. Okay? See that? So English Civil War is not in the 16th century. It has nothing to do with Elizabeth. We're going to stop at the end of Elizabeth's reign today. Um, I'll briefly mention James, and that's where we're going to stop. So don't go any farther in the book. Mostly you just have to listen to what I have to say, but there's a, some reading about Shakespeare. There's some reading about Elizabeth. Uh, <clears throat> and, and you need to, of course, review everything I said about Henry, and about religion, okay? So let's let's start let's start with this today. There's a lot of things to talk about. So let's just talk about this first. As you recall, England's Catholic. There's really no other choice. You're either Catholic or you have some strange religion, and people think you're worshiping the devil, uh, and um, you're not part of the community. Okay? It's Catholic, Christian, or something else secretly that's not accepted. Okay? The revolution happens when Henry VIII, for various reasons, which you should know for the quiz, <clears throat> decided um, one of the main reasons to divorce his wife because she didn't bear him a son, decided to create the Church of England. That happened, but everybody didn't convert. Everybody didn't automatically switch. So this is a really messy process. The king says, suddenly, like, yesterday we're Catholic, today we are Anglican. We are the Church of England. But most people don't really want to do that, okay? Most people consider themselves English and Catholic. <clears throat> but basically, Henry makes it so you can't be English and Catholic. You have to choose, okay? Most people choose to be English and, and Christian, right? And give up being Catholic. Those who don't go to jail or they get executed. For example, Sir Thomas More, okay? who wrote Utopia and was Lord Chancellor. There was others, but you don't need to know many of them. So Thomas More is a very famous person because he was a writer, a lawyer, a politician, and a martyr, right? He was used by the Catholic Church as an example why King, King Henry VIII was bad and why Catholic people should, English people should stay Catholic because look at what the Protestants are doing. They're killing you, right? They're persecuting you. Anyway, Henry goes forward with it. In his heart, he is still mostly Catholic, but he, he wants to be in control. So he tries to keep the Anglican Church like the Catholic Church as much, much as possible. Still has bishops, still has an archbishop, Canterbury and so on, but he does destroy the saints, right? He destroys the, the shrine of Becket, and he um, dissolves the monasteries, and he takes the money, he guts the church. Um, so the church has lost its financial power and its, its institutional power. So it starts to become, you know, unable to perform all of the things that I told you about, you know, the function of the Catholic Church in England, that it was, you know, the support system of the town, of the village, of the, of the uh, countryside, of the region, of the poor, right? Uh, taking care of orphans and education. They can't do that anymore because uh, they don't have the money to do that. They don't have the buildings, they don't have the people, they don't have the training or anything. So now the government is going to start to have to do this. So this is what some people call the Tudor Revolution, but that's just a, some historians. It's not a revolution. It's just the government has to start doing something because they, they, they destroyed the church's ability to do that. So in France, uh, in Spain and Italy, the church, the Catholic Church, continues to do those things. But in England, it can't. It, it doesn't have uh, the support of, of financial support or popular support because King Henry destroys it. 
So gradually, um, that's happening as he's getting older, and we'll ignore Henry now. So he dies, he gets really sick, and he's fat and old and probably going crazy. He dies. Um, <clears throat> so now we have Edward. Edward, uh, his son, is a boy. Uh, as with other boy kings, his uncle, right, um, Jane Seymour, who died, her, her father, <clears throat> Um, the Duke of Somerset, he's going to be in control. He's going to act like Edward's too young to actually do things. So Somerset, and he actually is, isn't trying to take over. He's really just running the country f on behalf of Edward. So he pretty much does a, a good job. But basically, Edward is grown up, um, educated, strongly Protestant. So <clears throat> he makes the Church of England more Protestant, right? So this is when they start, you know, saying, okay, don't have holy symbols and we don't like stained glass windows and we, you know, b bishops shouldn't wear golden clothes and we should not have an altar. We should move that and make it a table in the center because this, this shouldn't be some sort of magical ritual. This should be like just focus on the word uh, and the Bible and, and um, understanding <clears throat> and doing what God commands. There shouldn't be any fancy elements to it. It shouldn't be like a show, all right? And it shouldn't really be enjoyable. It should just be a serious, simple, direct ceremony as close to what the Bible is showing us as possible. So he, that's what Edward does. And so the Ang Anglican church becomes more like strongly Protestant. But then Edward gets tuberculosis, we think, uh, and he does, okay? One thing that Edward does he starts to um, make these schools, right? These public schools. They're not publicly funded, but anybody can go to them. So for example, Shakespeare is going to go to a grammar school. It's basically, a, they just teach uh, language and reading language, basic things. It's an elementary school, but they call it a grammar school because it's mostly language. It's not really math and science and physical education. So it's not like our public schools. And it doesn't, public school doesn't mean you go there for free. It means that if your parents have enough money to send you, you can go. It doesn't matter if you're a farmer or a blacksmith or a merchant, right? A business person or uh, a prince. You can, any, any kid whose parents can pay the, the money for, you know, uh, the teacher and the writing and paper, which is not cheap for a poor person in England. If you can do that, you can send them. That's why Shakespeare's father was a tradesman. He was a glover and he was also a government official. So he got to go to grammar school and learn a bit of Latin and learn how to read and write uh, and study the classics and stuff. This is the Renaissance. That's why we call this the English Renaissance because we go from Catholic Latin to English Bibles and public schools where everybody can go as long as they have money um, and they can get some education. Shakespeare would not have been possible a hundred years before. The Renaissance means uh, rebirth and part of that rebirth is studying Greek and Latin and philosophy and ideas, right? That, and, and language and rhetoric of Greek, Greece and Rome, which is, has, um, you study it in Latin and Greek, but there's also translations coming out in English. So you get this kind of rich human humanities in Munde, right? Education. This is why this period is essential. And this is why it's my favorite and I know it the best is because the 16th century is the rise of humanism in English. And there's an explosion of English literacy we're the English language and literacy department. This is it. This is the moment that caused the entire spread of English all over the world. I mean, you can't say it was destiny for, it to, for me to be here in Korea and teach about this, but I'm just saying this is where it starts. In the middle of the 16th century with Edward and the gram grammar schools and being more Protestant and English Bibles, people learning to, people having ideas and people thinking about uh, human beings instead of thinking about the world being revolving around God and religion and the church and doing unquestioning things. But 
the beginning of the process of looking at nature and human beings' relations to nature and, and looking at things logically and reasonably. It's, the age of reason is on its way, and the way that they, they get to it is by this classical education. Shakespeare gets a taste of this in grammar school, and then he possibly had access to libraries from wealthy people. He did a bit of tutoring, and then he joined, you know, he started acting and writing poetry, and, and he had access to books and uh, discussion and other intelligent intellectuals. He never went to university or anything. Um, he was largely, you know, self-educated, but he absorbed all of these stories. Most of Shakespeare's stories are related to um, legends, Greece, Rome, right? Tragedies. These are not new stories. They're, they're stories that uh, Shakespeare transforms. It's a rebirth of those stories. It's a rebirth of the, the story of Julius Caesar, the story of Romeo and Juliet and the Merchant of Venice. They're Italian. Their settings are Italian. Their settings are in, you know, ancient Rome. And Hamlet, is it? the setting is in Denmark. They're not new stories. Shakespeare didn't make them up. He learned them and then he, dare I say, improved them. He adapted them and made them into these incredible creations. That He was a part of this. There's many of them. I'm just saying Shakespeare because you all know him and um, that's I'm a Shakespeare scholar. So, okay. So Edward does this. He does this Protestant, pushing things more Protestant. He has these public schools and everything. Um, he's getting rid of Catholic priests and, and uh, rich people who are Catholic. So they're kind of uh, pushed out of the court. Then he dies, which means Mary, the oldest, oldest daughter, is going to be the queen suddenly. And she's super Catholic. They, there is another possibility that Edward's cousin, Jane Grey, um, could have become the queen. But she, she's not a tutor. She's a cousin. And um, given the choice between Mary, the, the, bro the sister of Edward, and the, the son of Henry VIII, who still, his legacy is still kind of making people a little bit uncomfortable, they choose Mary, which they probably regret. But Lady Jane Grey, she tries to raise an army, but everybody supports Mary, so she's gone from history. Don't worry about her. Um, Mary becomes a queen. She marries... King Philip of Spain, the future King Philip of Spain, um, who's super Catholic. And now, although there's that Catherine and Henry VIII connection, you know, the, the relationship between Spain and England is bad because Henry divorced Catherine like 20 years ago. So the, the Spanish said, don't do it. And he did it anyway. So the alliance between Spain and England is really shaky. But Mary tries to repair it by marrying him, but she's already pretty old. And Philip doesn't really want to spend time in England because England is still not a very important country. There's the Spanish Empire, which he's the emperor, he's the king of the king of Spain, of the Spanish Empire. And then up in the corner where it's kind of cold and dark and there's not a lot of, you know, uh, culture or or trade or or, you know, political importance going on. England's more of a backwater with a queen. That's it's nice to be married to the queen of, queen of England, but uh, the English people kind of reject King, uh, king Philip because they don't want a Spanish Catholic king. Um, so he doesn't, they, they allow her to be queen, but he never really, he becomes the, the queen consort. And he doesn't like that because he believes he should, by marriage, he should have control of England. But Parliament won't let him do that, and Queen Mary, quite, quite frankly, can't really allow it either. So all she does is basically support him. Doesn't go well. <clears throat> she tries to turn England back into a Catholic country, but by now, most of them don't want to do that. One of the reasons is because Henry VIII took control of all the church land, right? All the wealth. He used it, and he sold it. And who did he sell it to? He sold it to wealthy English people. Are those people are going to be, are they going to be Catholic or Protestant? The ones who bought the land from, they gave the money to buy the land. If they go back to being Catholic, they got to give back the land, the monastery, the churches, all of the, the wealth um, that they 
I mean, all the land, all the assets that they bought made them, pro they've invested in Protestantism. They don't want to go back to Catholic religion anymore because half of the people in the court own church land now. So not only does Mary not have the land, which would give her more money and more power, but the people who have the land now have a personal reason, a financial reason, rather than a religious or national reason, to not be Catholic. So she has a hard time convincing people that we should be Catholic again, even though a lot of people are still religious and some of them feel guilty. Most of the rich people don't want to give the land back. They don't want to sell it back. They want to keep it. They bought it. They believe it's theirs. Um, so there's no way for Mary to get these monasteries, these churches, these abbeys, um, their, you know, their community programs again. They're, they've already been dissolved. It's been 20 years that that they haven't been used and she doesn't have enough there's not enough priests there's not enough people to work in the church so she tries to do it it's not working a lot of people are resisting when people resist she puts them in jail uh, she kills them and often if they don't recant if they say i'm protestant and i won't i won't change back to catholic she burns them uh, so she get in which is a very bloody messy horrible way to die uh, so she gets this reputation for being bloody. So she gets <clears throat> the nickname Bloody Mary, right? Um, which is well-deserved in some sense. Um, but other, of course, Henry killed as many people as her, but she she gets the bad name. We don't call him Bloody Henry the Eighth, even though he killed a lot of people, probably many more, um, especially because he reigned for longer. But Bloody Mary is her nickname. Uh, it also is... Um, a cocktail where you um, mix some tomato juice and vodka and a little bit of spices, maybe some celery and a dill pickle in there. It's quite quite nice if you want to try it. Um, that's called the Bloody Mary. You can look it up on Google. But I'm not referring to the cocktail. I'm re referring to the, the woman, Mary Tudor. She doesn't manage to have, she thinks she's pregnant, but she's mistaken. Uh, she doesn't have any babies. And then uh, she, she gets some disease, I think it's some sort of cancer, some stomach infection, and um, she gets sicker and sicker and she dies. Uh, meanwhile, Elizabeth is in the tower. She kind of kept her nose out of trouble. So Mary had no reason to kill her really. Um, so she stayed in the tower, locked in the tower, the whole time that Mary was queen. And um, she was harassed quite a bit by various rich men. Uh, she's not gonna get married to anybody, so some people think there may have been some sexual assault or some you know, trauma that she went through, but we don't know. But Elizabeth was a young woman, very attractive, and she was vulnerable, but she was quite capable of defending herself publicly. So we don't know that anything ever happened. There was nothing. We just know that some rich old men were, were approaching her and trying to you know, arrange some sort of, um, what, what would we call it now, dating, some sort of courtship, but she rejected them all with, um, you know, some clever, manipulative sort of letters. She deflected all their interest and she stayed out of trouble. So Mary um, didn't have any reason to remove her. So when Mary dies, suddenly Elizabeth, who was third in the line and a woman and whose mother was executed for treason, she became, she's the most unlikely one to become the queen, of course, because if anybody else had had children at any point, it wouldn't have been her, but she's the last Tudor, Tudor kid. So they, you can imagine what it was like for Queen Elizabeth sitting in the tower, practicing different languages, because she was very, very smart. She was writing and doing poetry and letters in different languages, French and English and, and Greek and so on. And uh, one day, you know, uh, she hears that her sister's sick. And then a few days later, uh, your sister's dead. Um, long live the queen, opens the door and says, your majesty, this way, please. And out she is on the street, all of a sudden, crown on her head, covered in gold and being carried around uh, as the new queen. She's like 25 years old. <clears throat> uh, and, you know, without the expectation, usually when uh, a person becomes king or queen without expecting to, they end up being a pretty awful 
king or queen in some a leader in some way. Henry VIII, remember, he had an older brother and older sister. Arthur was supposed to be king. He died, and so and and his older sister Elizabeth was married to somebody else. He became the king by default, and he was more when he was young. He was more interested in uh, playing, women, hunting, sports, music, not being a responsible king. Queen Elizabeth is the opposite. She has a lot of similarities. Her red hair, her anger, her, her, her temper, like her, her father. Um, her, she's tall, she's beautiful, as her, her father was handsome when he was young. She's intimidating, um, she's intelligent. Uh, she probably deserves to be considered, you know, with Alfred the Great and, and uh, any of the other candidates for best king or queen, she should be called. She should be called Elizabeth Great. I don't know. Everybody has their different, you know, favorites. But I don't know. Queen Anne, um, personally, uh, Edward the First, and uh, Alfred, Alfred the Great, um, Canute. These are the people that could be chosen as the greatest. Elizabeth, she was great. Uh, she wasn't a warrior. Um, she couldn't really be because they wouldn't accept a woman as a warrior. Although she did dress up uh, in, you know, um, military outfits occasionally and make speeches. But she's 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 not actually um, doesn't actually fight in real combat. Uh, okay, so we're we've got to Elizabeth, <clears throat> which is our half of our objective today. In Scotland, they decide uh, half of Scotland stays Catholic. Uh, and there's a lot of Catholics still in England, even when Elizabeth takes over. But basically, this is what happens. Edward makes it more Protestant. He dies. Mary starts killing all the Protestants, tries to turn it into a Catholic country again. She dies. So that plan fails. Elizabeth comes out of the tower. She's ready, and so is everybody else, to just have some sort of compromise. So Ang and the Anglican Church settles in the middle, like I said. It looks Catholic but it thinks Protestant, just like Elizabeth herself. The Anglican Church is a, 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 a metaphor for Elizabeth. The kingdom itself, the, we use this, kingdom is the, the body of the king um, metaphor. It's, they took it literally back then. Like damage to, the, to her was damage to the kingdom, and damage to the kingdom was damage to her, right? If there was an attack on the kingdom and, and people were killed and things were burned and damaged, it was like a physical attack to her liver, okay? And vice versa. When the queen is sick, the country is sick. This is the way people think, okay? Um, the church is also a bodily metaphor for what Elizabeth represents. On the outside, she's got very expensive stuff. She appears, she's got a lot of makeup, she's got crowns and her hair done and everything. Inside, Though she, and when she speaks, not just inside, when she speaks, it looks, it looks like Catholic stuff. Candles, shiny, expensive, elaborate, hierarchical society. Castles, queens, right down, chain of being, right from the top, of, just like the Catholic Church. But when she talks, she talks about, I love the, I read the English Bible. I, I love the word of God. I I love the people, right? She talks like a Protestant person. She thinks like a Protestant person, even though she knows it needs to look. She needs that structure because that's the structure of Elizabethan society. So there's kind of a paranoia, all right? You can see it in Shakespeare too. Shakespeare is kind of a Protestant guy, but he's, he's got to behave. He's got to look and behave like a Catholic, even though sometimes he says things and he does things that are Protestant. Basically, the, soul, the whole society has kind of like got this <laughs> inherited <clears throat> paranoia that if, if the Catholic structure uh, were to fall apart, that society itself would fall apart. So everything still has to help be held together, right? So Elizabeth makes the Anglican Church look Catholic, but she goes along with all the things that the people want, right? She, it's all done in English. It's kind of it's kind of painted over, if you will. And literally, they do paint over a lot of the Latin stuff. Unfortunately, they paint over all the beautiful artwork. They smash a bunch of 
of windows. And that's what the Puritans are doing. Presbyterians and Puritans, they're like, we don't want it to look Catholic. We don't want it to be anything like Catholic, right? But kings and queens can't do that because <laughs> kings and queens are, are like bishops. Bishops are princes and princes are bishops. They're similar, right? The Pope is like an emperor or a king. So if they, they destroy that system, how, do they, how can they expect people to follow them? They, do, they still say, Queen, Queen Elizabeth still says, she's chosen by God, right? So she can't be completely Protestant and say, we're just gonna have church and everybody's just gonna do church the way you want. No, you have to do church. You can do it in English, you can do it simply, but you do it the way the church and the state organize it. We have, you have to go to church on Sunday. You have to dress up. You have to follow what the bishop says. You have to do your confession and ceremonies. And we're still going to keep the structure. And we're still going to collect money. And the money is going to go to fund the church. And Qu Queen Elizabeth is going to be the moderator of the church. They don't want her to be the, the head of the church because she's a woman. We have this problem with men, uh, women not, you know, getting the, the top positions in society. Um, I can't go into that too much, but... Queen Elizabeth overcomes this um, by compromising in many ways. And basically, all the powerful men, she uses them against each other. She, 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 is, she has different factions, and she gives her favor to the different factions, and she keeps a balance. And by keeping a balance between these powerful men, she elevates herself above them. And that's how she manages to be so successful. 40 years, almost, um, she does almost 40 years. Um, there's many crises. There's lots of disease. There's lots of unrest. There's a religious problem. There's money problems. There's war. There's her, her problem is should, should she get married? And if, as soon as she gets married, is the king become the king of England? And then is she lower than him? Uh, this is all these problems. She has to juggle them. And she does. She juggles them all and England starts to grow and become more powerful because, she, because of her skill. She's not just her skill, but she chooses uh, capable uh, leaders, officials, and she delegates and she controls, she makes intelligent decisions and she, she appears often. She travels around the countryside and lets people see her and then she, and she creates this whole myth about herself being this, you know, virgin queen, this Gloriana, this, uh, this figure, this mythical figure of, of um, you know, this uh, Diana, this, this uh, huntress and this uh, holy representation, right? Almost not human symbol of, of English, you know, nationality, right? Again, like I said, the body, of the kingdom is the body of, of the, the monarch. Her, her body is the kingdom's body. She goes around like with the her most beautiful things, and, but she goes around and, and she, she'll put her hand out of her coat. She'll go towards where the crowds are waiting and she'll wave to them and pass by them so that they can just get a glimpse of that. It's almost like a, celeb, it's like a celebrity thing, right? Just you get to see your favorite whoever it is, you just see BTS, you just see the limousine and they roll down the window and they wave and you just, I saw one time, one time when I was, when I was 18 years old, I saw my fav favorite BTS member. He rolled down the window of the limousine and I think he looked at me and he winked. I, I'm pretty sure. I'll remember that for the rest of my life. Okay. I don't know if you're BTS fans, but some people are like that. That's the kind of thing she did. The, the people she would go around and she'd pull the curtain and she'd put her hand out or she'd put her head by the window and just look and then a whole village would be in love with her forever. She was a master, master manipulator of the population. And so there wasn't really anything, like there was no rebellions or anything against Elizabeth because if uh, anything happened to her, the people would have ripped her apart. She was, she was very, very popular, even though there, it was hard times for the country. There's the same kind of thing. There was lots of disease. There was lots of death. There was lots of trade issues. There was lots of famine, bad weather, but they were inspired and she seemed to care, right? 
It's the same thing when the president live, w w uh, drives by, Donald Trump or Obama or Biden or whatever, and, and uh, they wave at the limousine window and everybody's like, oh, they're waving to me. Or like, you know, they show up in, uh, you know, at, at a cafeteria at the military and they sit down and have a piece of pizza with you and stuff. She did that stuff. Um, she was a master of PR, public relations. So that's Queen Elizabeth. Um, I just want you to know about her personality because she's a very uh, unique individual. The fact that she's a woman made it even more impressive. Um, okay. How, the, one of the major things she had to deal with was the money. So, um, of course, once Mary died, Philip of Spain is like, okay, um, now we're not connected to England. <clears throat> English, English, English ships are, are wanting to make money like the Portuguese and Spanish. The Dutch and the French, the Spanish and the Portuguese are getting incredibly rich. Everybody knows this. The English want to do it too, but they can't really because the Spanish and the Portuguese have already gotten all, all the good areas. So they end up, you know, trying to get over to North America where everything is frozen and there's no gold and spices. So what they do is they start uh, attacking pirates. They start attacking Spanish and Portuguese shipping, right? Spain doesn't like this, naturally. Um, and Elizabeth doesn't have very much money. So she actually um, wants to get in on this trade thing, but she doesn't have any money because you know, Mary and Edward and Henry haven't been taxing pro properly. And Henry um, spent all of the money from his father. So the, the Tudor state is very, very um, poor. So basically what she says is, okay, you guys, John Hawkins, uh, Sir Francis Drake, whoever these guys are, you can go, I will give you some really, I'll give you a few ships but I can't really pay you. You've got to do this on your own. Um, but she supports it. She gives them permission and she gives them some ships and they take their own ships too. And they go off into the ocean and they start trying to um, attack the Spanish sea lanes and they are successful. Um, I'm not going to tell you the story so it takes too long, but they're great stories. Very, very dangerous, adventurous, crazy stories. The, the most famous guy is Sir Francis Drake. Spanish hated him because he was always stealing their ships. He appeared out of nowhere and he sunk, he killed many Spanish people and he was super Protestant too. So you've got these Protestant English ships <clears throat> attacking Spanish ships and stealing their gold and stealing their spices and their money. And King Philip is getting angrier and angrier and saying, Elizabeth, stop this. And she's like, I don't know anything about it. I'm not doing it, it has nothing to do with me. Obviously it does. When they come back, they give her part of it. This um, <clears throat> privateering thing, privateering is unofficial sponsorship of pirates. So whenever the pirates, you know, got something, the English pirates, they brought back um, a whole bunch of, you know, treasure and they would give a certain amount to Elizabeth. And that helped her money problem. Um, she used to travel around to other people's castles with all of her court and make those rich peoples entertain her and pay for food and lodgings and everything for like a week. So she, one of the reasons she traveled around was to promote herself and let, let a lot of people see her. The other reason was uh, she didn't have to spend money in her own castle. She could go to other rich people's places and they had to pay for it. And this is, we're talking like, she's got hundreds of people with her. So it's expensive, you know? You're talking about somebody paying like several million dollars uh, for a week. And she just goes around the countryside to all of the, one by one, and they provide entertainment and food and drink and a nice place to stay. And she makes her, her progress around the countryside. And then she comes back to her castle. That saves a lot of money. And she gets to show her face to all of, you know, all of the people across England. <clears throat> she gives monopolies. We're going to talk about this more after the quiz, but she has these things called monopolies where um, she gives a person the right to tax certain products. So it could be soap or salt, right? Or nails. And that person would be able to regulate the price of that good. So they would be able to collect a certain amount. Every time somebody produced a nail, they would be able to collect a certain amount of money on it. So it's just like 
we think of monopolies as a bad thing today because it is. She would give one individual, one person, the the um, um, the right to can to collect money on one product, a monopoly. So they they would be able to collect all the taxes that was on, and they would set it and collect the taxes. So every all the soap makers would be super angry because there'd be a rich person saying, okay, whenever you make soap, soap I get 10% of, of the price of the soap. But she did this, <clears throat> she did this to, uh, instead of giving money, instead of giving money to high ranking people, uh, like officials, she needed to do business or she needed to raise armies. She, instead of paying them, you say, okay, you can have the soap monopoly, right? You're gonna be the Duke of, Duke of Wessex, and you are going to have be the have the soap monopoly. And okay, you you need I need you to be a general in this army. Um, and this is your reward is you're going to be you know you're gonna have the salt monopoly. So this is the way of uh, in instead of paying in cash. But they're privateers, <clears throat> privateers stealing money from Spanish mostly, loans. Uh, that's just borrowing money from rich people that say, okay, well, give me some money and I'll pay you back this much later with interest. There was a lot of that. The, the crown borrowed money from, uh, from banks and from rich people, from merchants in England and uh, in Europe as well. And finally, the one that she hated the most, when she was at war, she needed a lot of money. Then she would have to go to parliament because, you know, way back, you know, as things went from the Magna Carta forward. As you know, the parliament got stronger and stronger to the point where if you want extra tax because of a war, you have to call the parliament and you have to talk about it. And then Henry did it. And then the parliament would say, okay, because he's really strong. And Queen Elizabeth too could say, okay, we need this much money because we're fighting a war with Spain. But she hated asking them. All kings and queens until much later, the worst thing for them was to call parliament because usually parliament had some problems. For example, when she asked for money, they would say, well, we don't like the monopolies. So it will give you this money for the war, but we want you to stop the monopolies. But somehow Queen Elizabeth managed to, you know, make them feel guilty and, and, and uh, avoid giving them very much. But seven times she called parliament and she hated it every time. So there's already, even with Queen Elizabeth, who works well with government, there's a tension. And the only reason is because she's very clever and she has a reputation. Um, she uses all kinds of excuses to avoid the things that parliament wants. And so she gets the money anyway. But you're gonna see next lecture that when the leader isn't a, you know, essentially a genius like Queen Elizabeth or a super scary guy who's charismatic and tough like Henry VIII, parliament's not gonna listen until you give them what they want. Okay. All right. So that's what happens. <clears throat> so the queen, the queen is trying not to get married. Um, she's trying not to have war with Spain, but she's also stealing from Spain behind its back. And so she's, she doesn't have money for war anyway. So for years she tries to avoid this, but eventually, you know, the king, there's a revolt in Netherlands, the Spanish empire who is controlled is controlling the Dutch Netherlands at this time, sends an army there. It's a Protestant rebellion against Catholic Spain. And it's right, Netherlands is right across the water. And the only, really the only Protestant country that can help the Netherlands is England. So finally, Queen Elizabeth sends like 7,000 soldiers to help the Dutch. And the King of Spain says, that's it. We're gonna, we're gonna have to deal with these English once and for all. They raise a, a monstrous, um, <clears throat> hundreds of ships with thousands of men on them uh, and they create this gigantic fleet called the Spanish Armada and they, they sail it north towards um, the closest place to England from France, Calais. And you remember Calais because that's the last part of France that England has. Mary, Mary loses it. Uh, during Queen Mary's reign, France takes Calais back. Okay, so they're gonna go, Calais is the closest place to Dover. You can literally see across, like I said, they're gonna pick up a whole bunch of Spanish soldiers and they're gonna get it over to England. England basically has no army. Um, 
The Spanish have tens of thousands of veteran soldiers. The English have people with pitchforks and a few people with guns uh, that don't use them. So they're in big trouble if the soldiers get across. <clears throat> so they don't let them. The Spanish Armada comes up. The thing is about the Spanish Armada is it's, it's not, it's impressive on paper, but actually the, a lot of the food was out of date. Um, the cannons and the cannonballs didn't fit. The, the sailors were not experienced. The admiral who was supposed to command died right before. So they appointed a new guy who had no experience commanding ships. So everybody's sort of inexperienced and confused. It costs a huge amount of money, but the English ships are better, the English sailors are better, the leadership is better, they have better weapons, um, the, the ships are faster, they know the water. It's a complete disaster. The, the, the Spanish Armada sails up, the English Navy comes out to meet them, um, they harass them, they burn, they send fire ships in, they chase them away from their landing spot so the the um, Spanish army that's supposed to be there to be picked up just leaves. So the Spanish ships are just there and they have nowhere to go. So they get chased up the channel. They go all the way around England. If you remember the map, they go all the way around Scotland, all the way to the top because they, the wind is facing, the, the wind is blowing them that, that direction. When they go around in the North Sea, a huge storm comes out of the Atlantic Ocean, smashes half of the ships on Ireland, and when the, the Spanish soldiers wash up on the shore, the Irish come down and chop them into pieces. And the, the few ships that are damaged or, or uh, survive that, that long journey around the United Kingdom and Ireland slowly get make their way back to Spain, like pieces, pieces of hundreds of ships left. Like the amount of people, equipment, and money that is lost is unbelievable. But that's how rich Spain is, that they do it again. That's not the end. But 1588 becomes the, the date that, that uh, God chose England over Spain. God chose the Protestant Englishmen, right? The Spanish Catholic, um, the, the doom, the, the destiny of the English Protestant kingdom was to be great. And the Spanish, the, the Spanish were, um, they had the same belief. The Spanish believed that God was gonna give them victory. They, they actually, the leaders of the Spanish Armada, most of them, knew that their equipment wasn't as good. They knew that the English were better sailors, they knew that their ships were old and, and in bad condition and that they didn't have the right food or provisions or ammunition and that the only way they were going to win was if God helped them. They, they were, the king of Spain said, when he was told about the condition of it, he said, God will provide the means for victory. We'll get a miracle, but there was no miracle. Instead, um, they, you know, <laughs> you could say reason and logic and, and what was expected to happen, happened. But the English took it to mean that God was on their side, right? So, and they called that the Protestant wind. The Protestant wind came and blew the fleet, scattered the fleet, and then they, they traveled, they tried to travel around the islands, and then God caused a storm to come in and smash the fleet. So that is 1588. Now, so I, I'm gonna try and wrap this up before this becomes an hour long. These are all Elizabethan era, 16th century things. So there's, in the book, you gotta read a little bit. Shakespeare, uh, from the 1580s, uh, she, she had a, Elizabeth had a splendid court. She loved poetry, she loved art and music, and especially theater. So this is, of course, not just Shakespeare, but Ben Jonson and Marlowe and, and other great playwrights um, and, and poets, Edmund Spencer and um, who I'm not going to be able to remember everybody's names, Sir Philip Sidney, um, etc. There are many. There's there's a whole generation of them, several generations, um, and she encourages this. She the the Elizabethan court court is like an incubator for English literature. There's an explosion of English material. This is when it happens. And from, it, ne it never really slows down, except for during the English Civil War. There's kind of a pause because the Puritans are gonna get control. And Puritans are the radically Protestant people. 
They only eat, sleep, work, and pray. They don't like parties. They don't like fun. Read about it in the book, what I, how I describe them. They like plain clothes, and they, in Sunday, you follow the rules exactly, and they're basically killjoys, okay? Um, Elizabeth hated them, and any royal person really hated them because, you know, the court is full of splendor and expensive things and food and, and entertainment and, and luxury. So the Puritans hated, uh, naturally, they're naturally, they're natural enemies. So the English Civil War will be partly about that. Catholic versus Puritan, you know, um, celebration versus, you know, ethical hard work and focusing on, you know, the, the mundane um, elements of life and, and uh, keeping things as simple and focused on, on uh, the everyday as you can. That's what Puritans are. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're sort of really serious, dedicated, um, religious reductionists. Anyway, I would just call them a killjoy. They don't like having any fun. Those are Puritans. Elizabeth couldn't stand them and neither could any of the other kings or queens. Um, as I mentioned to you before, part of the reason is Edward started these grammar schools and uh, they had tutors and Anglican and Catholic priests are in the countryside and they're, they're teaching in English. They're raising um, generations of literate people. It's slowly happening, but over the next hundred years, the, the literacy is just gonna go from a small part of the upper class being able to read to, you know, um, many of, of the middle class upward, many of the people um, are going to become literate. The literacy rate's gonna triple, double, it's gonna double, triple, quadruple, and, and you know, going into the 18th century, it's just gonna um, lower and lower into the classes are gonna be included um, in, and this is a process, it's an evolution, right? But again, Shakespeare's sort of one of the people in the, the first wave of, of these um, non-noble. I, I wouldn't say, he's more like, a, it's not a middle class. He's like lesser gentry or trades, tradesmen or a merchant class, right? He's not a middle class person, it's not the right term. But he's not a noble. He doesn't belong to the gentle class but he, he, is, he has access to it through his education <clears throat> and, and through his own um, ability. So social mobility starts, the chain of being starts breaking down. There, the structure is still there, but people start moving up and down in it. And as I told you, you know, the 14th century had something to do with that too. The Black Death and the Peasants' Revolt, this is a continuing evolution. Um, Queen Elizabeth still wants people to stay in their places but Shakespeare wants to move up a little bit. Moving up a little bit is okay. He, he's not gonna become a duke, he's not gonna become the king of England, but he's gonna go from a Glover's son, you know, to a famous actor, to, to buying his own coat of arms and being uh, allowed into the gentry. He's not in the peerage, he's not gonna be a baron or a lord, but he's gonna be a lesser gentleman when he dies. Shakespeare's gonna be a lesser gentleman. There's Francis Drake. Francis Drake, was the worst, worst thing that happened to the Spanish, as I said. He, not only did he steal and sh sink a whole bunch of their ships and kill a lot of their people, he also went all the way around the world. Unlike Magellan, he didn't die halfway. And on the way, he stole stuff from the Spanish and went and made money and then came home and then dropped off a whole bunch of money. Um, so he became a hero. Went around the world and brought back mountains of treasure at the same time. Uh, Sir Francis Drake was a legend in his own time, the king of the privateers. Elizabeth is eventually going to die, though, in 1603, and she's not going to get married ever, because I know I said already that was one of the big issues. We, we had the king's great matter. Well, we have the queen's great matter, too. It's her marriage. Everybody's like, well, who's going to be king next? She solves this. Her cousin, and I can't get into it, her cousin is Catholic, and she tries to overthrow Elizabeth, and Elizabeth finds out about it. She doesn't want to kill her, but everybody agrees she's causing too much trouble. If Elizabeth dies, they're going to end up with a Scottish, half French, Scottish Catholic queen. And we can't have that. And she said she was going to kill you, Elizabeth. You got to kill her. So she gets executed. Her cousin. She has to 
She doesn't want to do it because she's also a queen. She's the queen of Scotland. And it's not good for kings and queens to execute each other because, you know, if you do that, then some someone else is going to execute you, right? It's kind of like once you start that, oh, we're allowed to kill kings and queens, then they start doing it. Um, so she reluctantly does it, but she has no choice, really. Um, but when she dies, and she doesn't say this to like, she's almost dead. She's like, ah. My, my nephew James, like, you know, the last couple days, she's like, finally, okay, my nephew James, her cousin's son, the one that she executed, he will be the next king. He's the king of Scotland, right? He's the king of Scotland. So he, when, when she dies and he comes down to London, he becomes King James I. He's already King James VI in Scotland, but he um, becomes King James the first of England. So he's King of Scotland and England. Talk about him next lecture. Last thing for the quiz, very important. London, <clears throat> what Elizabeth is going to do is draw people in from the countryside. She's gonna make London the most important uh, city. And um, more and more nobles are going to live in London. London's gonna get bigger and bigger. The trade and the entertainment and the proximity to Elizabeth the business and the politics is all gonna happen instead of happening in castles in far parts of England, in the north, in the west, um, far away. Everything's gonna be concentrated politically and commercially and culturally in London. London's gonna get bigger and bigger and it's gonna become disgusting and dirty. Uh, but people are gonna move there because th there's kind of a population boom happening right now um, and there's not enough work. And the best place to find a job is in London. So people who don't have jobs, they go to London. Um, but London is so disgusting and full of disease that there's more people dying in London than being born. So the death rate in London is higher than the birth rate. So people are dying faster than they're being born. But there's so many people coming from the countryside that the population is going up. So. Um, King James comes from Scotland, and when he sees London, he's like, oh my god, this is, this city is like, this is ruining, this is like a cancer uh, of the kingdom. This is like a big, black, disgusting, you know, I don't know, infection on your body. This is like the infection in the kingdom. He didn't like it at all. He, he's Scottish, so I think he probably preferred to have a castle on, on the side of a mountain beside a swamp or something like that. But he did like the money. London, people in London had money. It was central. London was the most important place. London made the decisions about everything. So without London, you couldn't, without London, you couldn't control. Without London, you couldn't control the kingdom. You had to, London made um, those decisions. So it was crowded and was busy. Um, lots of people died. The mortal mortality rate was, was so high and the population was very dense. It was the densest place. It was the only real city and it was disgusting. So dirty, diseased, lots of death. But um, as I said, one of the good things about it was there were jobs and um, there were connections and there was power. Okay, so even though it was dangerous because you're probably gonna die young, I think um, I read, don't quote me exactly, but the average life expectancy in London was like 31 in 1600. So yeah, if you, you know, you're 20 and you move to London, you might die in 10 years. Like I'm 40, like I would be, I would be well over the hill. I would be a very fortunate person to have lived. You guys only have 10 years left of your life if you're living in London. So you, you better uh, work hard and enjoy life, carpe diem and all that, right? Okay, I, th I think I've covered all that I can. The 16th century, as I said, it's a very important period and it's the period I know the most about. Um, let me st stand to the side so you can get your screenshot. But again, don't worry about 116 forward because I'm gonna cover that after the quiz. There's lots of material from the beginning of the century um, about the religion, about the Reformation and the tutors um, for you to um, focus on for the quiz. So quiz on Friday, don't forget, that's April 15th. Thank you for listening. And like I said many times before, um, 
if the lecture seems a little bit long, then take a break, pause it, come back to it, make your notes, and uh, stay, stay fresh for the whole thing. Good luck on the quiz. Please don't skip it. It's very important. You finish your quizzes. Um, be on time and submit it before 11.10. Have a good week.